back. Um, nice to see some different faces as well as some familiar faces up here. Hello to everybody downstairs. Right, I promised something different. Um, we're not going to do there's not as much technical um, stuff to do with the interactions as we saw. We are going to see another process algebra, another syntax, I'm afraid, but this one's got a lot simpler syntax. So this work um, essentially came out of work done with biology, so I'm primarily talking about a language called proper, which is a probabilistic programming um, process algebra, but that came from biology, and it actually came, comes from the question that Salim asked at the end of the PEPPA talk about finding parameters. So when we're modeling with PEPPA, we assume we do know about our system, but often we don't, and this is particularly the case with when we're modeling biology because you just can't measure lots of things in biology. So you need to have some way of building a model and leaving a bit of uncertainty within it and then exploring the behaviors that you see from the model to find the best match to the data that you can get from the system. And that tightens up some of that uncertainty. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So a quick reminder on stochastic process algebras, but quickly moving on to modeling biological processes. And I mentioned this morning that we actually make a, a dialect of PEPPA that's more suited to biology, um, partly because of this issue of conservation again, that PEPPA just has a fixed number of components, and biological systems are not like that. They make proteins, they decay, all the rest of it. So, so I'll talk about BioPEPPA first, and about modeling biological systems, and then move on to, to PROPA, the new language. So this is just a very quick recap. Remember that what we're talking about are, are basically agents that undertake actions that have exponential delays, and then we use formal semantics to give us um, the process of two steps, um, the Markov chain there. And uh, what we find from this is that we can see things about the mathematical structures that are in there at the level of the syntax, so the process algebra, which is advantageous. We can make use of the compositionality. We've only looked at it uh, this morning in terms of building up the model in terms of the components, but there's also ways of breaking down the solution in terms of the components. We can use formal reasoning techniques, such as equivalence relations, which we saw informally um, with the model reduction and aggregation, but we can also use techniques related to logics. and um, is what we saw, the bi Markovian by simulation, I didn't present it in those terms, but when we did that counting abstraction, what we were doing was finding ways of producing the model. And, as I've said, um, model checking. So over the last couple of decades, stochastic process algebras have sort of spread far and wide, as process algebras have too, into many different application domains. And quite often when we start to look at a new application domain, we need to slightly change the features of the language. Uh, so this is a, a whole kind of strand of research, not just for myself, but many other people, of looking at application domains and trying to find a neat language, so not too many operators, something that you can deal with, find the semantics reasonably well, but is expressive enough for the domain that you're looking at. So Karma, as I said, is still an ongoing sort of experiment to some extent for the collective adaptive systems, Canveria. Uh, but we've had other languages, for example, Hype is one of ours, Hyper is another one developed in the Netherlands, which are looking particularly at um, hybrid systems where you have continuous behavior and discrete. Um, and I've talked about Karma, Paloma is a sort of simpler version of Karma. And then ecological processes is another one where people have looked at this, so they're looking at um, things like the disease spread, but also predator prey systems. Um, other sort of uh, invasive species systems in ecology. But probably the most um, biggest area of application domain where there are many stochastic process algebras is biological systems, in particular what's called systems biology, which is looking at taking a, a systems-based approach, really thinking of biological processes as systems as a whole, which was quite different that often biologists, when they're studying systems, take what's called a reductionist approach, that they will focus on one particular protein, try to understand its structure, what role it plays, and really analyze it in great detail. And instead, the systems biology approach tries to look at the processes that happen, so it might be a signaling pathway or um, something that goes wrong in a disease, 
looking at all the different proteins that are involved in that and sort of just look at it differently. And in that area, uh, stochastic process algebras have been quite influential. I'm going to talk about biopepper. So this arose mostly because um, there was a very influential paper in 2002 in Nature, uh, which was called Cells as Computation. And what the authors, Rajem and Shapiro, did was point out a kind of analogy between concurrent processes as represented by process algebras with what happens in cells um, in different cases. So in particular, the basic unit of computation, if you like, in the cell, because there's a, a lot of computation, or at least information processing that happens in a cell, is the molecules. And they pointed out an analogy that these are like concurrent computational processes. And whereas we have synchronous communication, just like we do in PEPA, where we have things jointly cooperate, what you would have in a cell is molecular interaction, quite often complex is being formed. And then we have ideas of transitional mobility within concurrency. And this is like biochemical modification. Sometimes things become phosphorylated, so they change their conformation, or they relocate. So a, a molecule may move from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. And so they pointed out this analogy, and it became hugely influential and spawned a whole lot of uh, new stochastic process algebras because timing is important in these systems to understand the relative rates of different um, complexifications and things uh, to model uh, biology. So I'm going to talk particularly about biopepper, which is uh, sort of the pepper response to this demand from biologists for new languages to formally describe the processes they want to study. So the basic unit of a component in this case is called a species. This is the biological term that they talk about a species for any kind of molecule. So typically this would be a sort of some kind of protein. It might be a protein called SARC, for example. Or it might be RNA. So there would be a, an RNA that encodes the SARC. Or it might be DNA. So anything that is an entity within the, the bio, uh, biochemistry, they will call a species. And these are our components in biopepper. And then reactions um, are just as we would expect an action in pepper. So reactions combine different components, species, into um, possibly new components. <coughs> and these each have a dynamics which is exponentially distributed, but now it might be a function because this always depends on the state of the system in biochemistry. And so the species components are composed together, essentially we make a big soup of whatever the biochemistry is, and we let the rules of the language tell us what reactions are possible. So we might see that once we introduce some coding mRNA, we'll see an increase in the amount of protein, um, but when the RNA decays, then the protein will start to decay, and we'll see a decrease in that. So the state of the system at any time um, consists of the local states of each of the sequential components. This is just like we saw in Pepper. We looked at, for example, whether the person was in corridor, um, let's say, 1, 5, and whether the database reflected that or not. So we were just looking at the local states of each of the components. But now our local states are slightly different because the local states are what we say are quantitative, so they just count how many copies we have. So we're counting molecules, essentially. And our reactions... Um, so the local states are the, the amounts, as I say, and then reactions will change the amounts according to slightly different rules. So with pepper, we always said things either went up or down by one. Okay, so if processor zero becomes processor one, we decrease processor zero by one, we increase processor one by one. Okay, so because we just have a straightforward movement of things because it's conservative. In the biochemistry, it's not like that. We're used to the idea of things like uh, water, when we have H2O. So that's called stoichiometry. It says we need two hydrogens and one oxygen to make one molecule of water. So we have in our reactions now this idea of stoichiometry, that we know that hydrogen interacts with oxygen, produces water, but we need two of the hydrogen, one of the oxygen, to produce one of the water. So this is um, our syntax. It's a lot closer to pepper, but just slightly different um, because we're, our view of the system is this new quantified kind of approach. 
So we have a prefix as before, but our prefix now is a whole set of different prefixes. So it still means our first reaction has to be doing an alpha with stoichiometry kappa. But now we have these different possibilities where the down arrow means I'm a reactant in this reaction, so I'm going to be used up. So when I as a species S carry out an alpha with um, stoichiometry K, afterwards I'll be S, but there'll be K less molecules of me, or kappa less molecules of me. Conversely, the up arrow says I'm a product of this reaction. So if I'm involved, I will afterwards have the number of molecules I have plus kappa. Okay, so it's just keeping account of how the molecules are changing by the reaction. And then these ones, I actually don't change my count. So it's just saying, I'm involved in this reaction, but I, my personal count or my local state doesn't change. But I might be enhancing it, I might be inhibiting it, or I may be just neutral. So this is, for example, with DNA. We need the DNA there to produce mRNA, but the amount of DNA doesn't change. We don't strictly need to have three different symbols here, but it's to make our models readable. I mean, these are all just saying, I'm a witness to this um, reaction. I'm not taking part myself. But we use the different symbols because it helps us read and make sure we believe our models. We have a choice, just as before. So some chemical species may be involved in different reactions, or the mRNA could be used in transcription or be degraded. So we have the different possibilities, just as we've seen before, and we also just have constants to name things. And then the, the model component is a bit like the system equation that we have with Pepper, the same idea that we have, uh, oops, sorry, we took two plus there. We have a, a cooperation, but now actually we generally assume that this set L is the set of all um, reactions. So we have no notion of making a reaction private the way that we could with pepper. So if um, I'm a hydrogen and it's, the reaction is make water and there's an oxygen, I have to take part in that jointly. Okay, so we just have a forced interaction. And then this is just saying that the local state of each species is recording the count there. So I've got L molecules of S in my system. And then I make a big soup of all of that. And then each reaction separately has a function that tells me the rate of that reaction. So these, we use a function to define the rate, but the rate is an exponential distribution, just as with PEP. Okay. We define semantics. I'm not going to show you the semantics. It's a little bit more complicated, but essentially it's very much like the PEP semantics, but we split it in two steps, because just as here, we separated out the rate information when we have just I'm sorry it's wiggling so much, uh, it's, it's nothing I'm doing, um, but it uh, makes you feel quite seasick. Um, so when we have all this information, it's only telling you what's possible. So it's like a classic process algebra, it tells you what reactions are possible, and then the rates are governed by these rate, um, rate functions, which are defined separately. So when we come to define the semantics, we first have a capability reaction, which is very much like the pepper ones, with the rules above the line and below the line, and we can infer what's possible. And then we have the stoichiatric, stoch the stochastic relation, which will tell us the rate of the transition based on the parameters of the model. And that will depend on how many uh, molecules you have. For example, it would depend on the temperature that your model's at and the rest of it. So we just have these two, so what the stochastic relation does is it just um, takes the capability relation and calculates what the rate should be. So we have a very simple um, example. This one's not actually biological, but it's just given as an um, intuitive example. So we have, it's a gossip spreading example. So we have three types of people. Um, now, I would say they are innocent um, spreaders and repressors. My PhD student likes to call them ignorance. Suppressors and, um, and spreaders and repressors. We have some people who don't know the current gossip. Let's call them innocents. Uh, and if they meet someone who does know the gossip, who is a spreader, then they will interact by the spread action, and the innocent will themselves become a spreader. 
The reason why gossip sometimes gets stopped might be because we have someone who is a repressor, who when they meet somebody spreading the rumour just goes, oh really, that's old news? And then the spreader thinks, well, there's no point in that anymore. Or the spreader meets another spreader and realise, no, actually, yeah, it really is old news, and so they stop. So either of those cases, they become a repressor. It's very similar to the susceptible infected recovered model, it's just slightly different and serves our purposes um, here. So this is the biopepper model of this system. So this is the capability bit. This tells us that an innocent can take part in the spread, and if so, the number will be reduced by one. A spreader can take part in the spread, and if so, the number will be increased by one. And they can be stopped in the two ways uh, according to whether they interact with another spreader or with a repressor, and then the repressor will be increased by either of those interactions. Okay. So that's the, the sort of capability. This is our, our soup, our system equation. We're saying here we start with 10 innocents, um, 5 spreaders and no repressors. And this is where we define our, our rules. So this is what's called mass action dynamics. So it says, I have a basic idea of how fast I spread, which is KS, and then I have as many chances of doing that as I have innocent people and spreaders people. So there are all the possible ways that they may interact with each other. Okay, so we have the basic rate multiplied by the number of innocent and the number of spreaders. And the same here we see the spreader-spreader interaction and here the spreader-repressor. And we set the particular values that we want for KS and KR, in this case, to be 0 0.5 and 0 0.1. Okay, so that's just a, a brief introduction to the syntax for BioPepper. So, BioPepper is an example of many different formal languages that have been used for systems biology, and they're found to be quite useful, and there's a very interesting paper, if you're interested, by um, Jasmine Fisher and Tom Hensinger, that talk about the idea of executable cell biology. So you encode your cell biology into these languages, and then you can um, essentially just simulate it or use other analysis techniques to see what's happening um, in the system. So they can be compiled into executable models and run to deepen understanding, and then they can also be subjected to various rigorous tests. Uh, for example, we've done some work where we've worked backwards from models that are presented in papers and encoded them in the process algebra and then found that actually the models, as written by the biologists, usually in ODEs, um, are not consistent, and there's all kinds of problems. So being able to do things in a formal language gives you a lot of mechanisms to really investigate further. Um, and the, when you execute the model, you get some data which you can compare with the biological model. So this is perhaps a system that you're observing, and you can collect some data and then see how well your model matches. But the difficulty is that what about if there is some part of your system is not known? Okay, so say we can, um, we can see when innocence becomes spreaders, but we can't really see the progression to repressors. So we don't know what rate to put there for, for KR. And uh, this is a shortcoming that usually what happens is we do what's called optimization. So we look at the, the problem of matching model output to data as an optimization where we want to minimize that distance, and this is done iteratively and manually in many cases. Or I mentioned earlier that we sometimes use things like evolutionary um, algorithms to do this. But it's quite a painful process. Now I'm sure you're all aware of machine learning and data science, because it's very much the hot topic, and this produces a very different approach to building models where the idea is that you collect lots of data and then you just sort of extract the model from the data that you've got. So the model creation is instead data driven. And so in particular, if we look at a Bayesian statistics kind of framework, what we have is the data that we collect from our system, from whatever phenomenon we're watching. We have some prior belief, which we might encode as a, a shape of a model, if you like, but without knowing what the parameters are. And then we use inference from the prior and the data to reach a posterior, which is an updated model that's more, um, gives a better account of the data than the prior did. 
So we represent belief and uncertainty as probability distributions. So we're not just saying there is one Earth, so we're saying there is evidence to support with certain probabilities, say that the parameter is 0 0.5, but there may be a different probability that it's 0 0.4. And so we have some idea rather than saying, as we would with an evolutionary, biology, um, evolutionary algorithm, it is 0 0.6. Um, we treat both parameters and un unobserved variables in the same way, and in all the rest of the talk, I'll talk about those as theta. And then we apply Bayes' theorem, which is saying that um, the probability of a certain setting of the parameters and the unknown variables, uh, given the data, is proportional to our prior, which is what we believe to be the probability of the thetas, multiplied by the probability of data given that setting of the thetas. And then we have here underneath the probability of data, but that's, uh, we just ignore that. And we're just looking at this relation with posterior is proportional to prior times likelihood. So this is just a, a quick illustration. So we might have a prior distribution like this. We know nothing. We've just made it a, a normal distribution. I think we mean six there. Um, quite a wide variance. As we start to collect some data points, we've got 20 data points there. You can see that our posterior has shifted. As we collect more data points, our posterior is shifting further until we get to this point, and this is typically what happens, that our distribution gets narrower because the evidence is that it's centered much further over there, around 10, um, <coughs> when we've got 60 data points. So we want to kind of harness this to understand our models uh, in this way. So we have these two different approaches to building models. There's the machine learning approach where we try and extract the model from data generated from the system and then refine the model based on system behavior using these kind of statistical techniques. Or we have what we've developed with this process algebras, which is often called mechanistic models, where we focus very much on what we understand about the mechanisms that drive the system. Uh, and so we start from that description or hypothesis, and then algorithmically mimic the system, and then try and see whether the data we produce matches the data from the, the real system. So they have sort of complementary strengths and weaknesses. So in the data-driven um, approach, we have a much more rigorous handling of parameter uncertainty. Okay, so we're not trying to hand fit anything or using um, genetic algorithms. We have the Bayesian reasoning that lets us calculate how we can reduce the uncertainty given the data. But these approaches, such as Bayesian reasoning, are typically not applied to stochastic models. Okay, so it's just starting to happen. We've, we've published some algorithms and a few other people have in the last few years. But many of the techniques don't work well with stochastic models because you need to know in advance, for example, to use some of the um, Gibbs sampling techniques, how many steps your model will make in a certain time. We don't know that because we're using random variables. And so it's, uh, it's quite difficult to, to handle stochasticity, which is different to our uncertainty. And in many cases, uh, when we do see machine learning in these uh, systems, we have to have bespoke solutions. So somebody will be modeling a particular system, they'll build a, a data-driven model, they'll make a bespoke inference algorithm that just works for that one model, and they'll publish that result, and then they start again with the next one. With the mechanistic models, as we saw with Pepper and even with Karma, our focus is much more on having general execution engines. So we try and design it so that we don't need to write the, sol the solver for every model. We have a general solver. We just describe it in the language, and it will compile to our appropriate solver. Uh, the models can be used to investigate the role of parameters. So we're not limited only to observations. We can think about different futures, different alternatives, which you can't do when you're using a data-driven approach because you're just driven by the data. Um, but parameters in this case are generally known, assumed to be known or fixed, or we have to use these quite costly fitting algorithms. So the idea that we approached um, for this problem was to try and think about, well, is there some way of marrying these together to get a formal modeling technique with an engine that is reusable to avoid the bespoke situation, 
but is better at handling uncertainty in the model. So it doesn't make the assumption that Pepper makes that you know all your parameters to begin with. Okay, and so this was the, the starting point. We started with BioPepper because we were very much looking at biological examples, and we developed this new language proper, particularly to investigate these issues. So Copper uh, comes from the idea of probabilistic programming. How many of you have come across probabilistic programming at all? Anybody? A little bit? Okay, so this is uh, it's come out of machine learning, data science, and the idea of embedding. So it's the community themselves recognizing this idea that you don't always want to write a bespoke solver for every machine learning problem. You want to have something a bit more general. And so probabilistic programming languages essentially do conditional probabilities and um, uncertainty in a standard programming language. So instead of having particular variable values, you can say um, a distribution, or um, you can say that this is conditional on some other probability. So this that offers then automated inference without having to write the solutions. There are many different platforms. Um, they've been around, so languages like Eibel and Church have been around for probably slightly more than 10 years. And in the last few years, there's been a real explosion with newer languages like Anglican, Stan, and WebPPL. And the key idea is that you specify a distribution that you expect your um, variables to, to be within. You specify some observations that you have about the system, and then you infer a posterior distribution from the combination of those. So the general um, workflow is that you use a small program to describe the system that's generating data. So uh, this is very much like a conventional programming language, but with some uncertainty. You can specify your observations. So if, when we do this, we're going to do it as um, time series of amounts of protein, but depending on your type of system, it may be different. Uh, what your observations are. Um, there's some very nice examples uh, for the language fun where they're looking at kind of who done it type scenarios and they're looking at who's, who's most likely to committed the crime and whether it happened in the library or the uh, basement and this sort of thing. So your observations can be different things. I'm going to talk, as I say, about time series. We, our system also works with logical formula, so you can also say um, what you expect your observation to be in terms of the temporal logic. And then you've got, you've got two options. You can do what's called running the program forward, where you run the execution of the program, but if it's producing an answer that's not in line with your observations, you just throw away that answer. It's not a good run. Okay? And then using that information, we can run backwards to tell us more about those uncertain variables, because we'll find that sometimes certain settings of the uncertain variables don't produce good data. And so we can, at the same time, as we're running forwards to produce good data, constrained by our observations, we learn what the posterior, so what the updated distribution should be that keeps us closer to those good observations. So this is what we wanted to combine with the process algebra. So the objective was to retain all the nice things we like about stochastic process algebra, so it should be simple in terms of components, but it should have a rigorous um, semantics in terms of a mathematical structure that can be executed. But it should incorporate the probabilistic programming language features such as recording uncertainty, um, ability to bring in some observations, and access to inference. So if we go back to our rumor spreading example, so this is just as it was before, we may want to admit that we don't really know these rates here. Okay, so they're, they're unknown to us. So instead we can just say, well, we believe they're something between 0 and 1. We don't know what the real values are. Um, and in this case we've chosen a uniform distribution. We can bring in some observations, so we have a new syntax that just says observe, and in this case we're using trace, and that would just be a CSV file of output values for the species at certain time points. Okay, so just tell us at certain time points um, how many innocent spreaders and regressors we have. And typically we would only have those at a small number of time points. In the experiments I'm going to show you, we had 10 time points for that. Uh, and then we say which inference approach. 
Now we have a number of different inference approaches, but because I'm focusing on language rather than machine learning in this talk, I'm just going to talk about ABC, which is the simplest intuitive one, but the framework actually supports a number of different ones. So in terms of our model now, this is proper instead of biopepper, it's really not that much different. All the, the behavioral part is the same, it's just using the biopepper syntax and essentially the same semantics except that now we've got this idea of the prior distribution, at the bottom we've got our observations and our inference. So we saw that Biopepper had a semantics, um, I didn't actually show you it, but I told you there was a capability relation, which was the same kind of rules as we saw for Pepper, that we can infer different transitions and then that gives rise to a continuous time Markov chain. But now that we're working with proper, this can't be a continuous time Markov chain because we don't know the rates. A continuous time Markov chain must have, if you think of the original diagrams and the matrix, we have to have a concrete value for each of those transition rates. The proper model has uncertainty for these parameters, and so it, can't, it has to be mapped to something different. But instead of being mapped to um, a single continuous time Markov chain, in fact, what happens is we map to a distribution over continuous time Markov chains. Because as the if you think of just having one unknown parameter, it has a distribution, and we can instantiate a separate continuous time Markov chain for each possible value that that parameter has. Now, we're not going to do that because generally we're not talking about discrete distributions, we're talking about continuous, but that's the sort of intuition. Something up on the picture. So here's where we have, if we know that uh, the parameter has a concrete value, we get one continuous time Markov chain. If we had a set of values, we would have a set of continuous time Markov chains, one for each of the different k's between 0 and 5, um, and if we instead have a, a distribution for that, we get a distribution of continuous time Markov chains. Now typically in our model we will have more than one unknown variable, so it's not quite such a straight mapping, but it still always works out that we have a distribution of continuous time Markov chains. So what is one of those? Um, Unfortunately, we looked around in the literature and somebody defined not quite the right thing, but something very close. And this is called a constraint Markov chain. And this is not dealing with continuous time, but it's looking at discrete time. Uh, so our transitions would have probabilities rather than rates. And it's made up of a set of states. This is a continuous time Markov chain. It has an initial state. It has a, a notion of atomic propositions. We can think of those as just the names of states in Pepper. And then it has um, acceptable labelings for each state. As I say, if we just map it to the, the state names, that's very straightforward. But then the key thing is it has a constraint function for um, each state under rate is um, acceptable or not. Okay, so this is the definition of a, a constraint Markov chain. So from our point of view, it wasn't quite what we wanted, um, because in a CMC, arbitrary constraints are permitted. So previously what people had done was they talked about um, bounded Markov chains, so they said very particular uh, values or interval Markov chains, but they're not compositional, whereas with the constraints that you can get the composition. So that's good, but here they're just fixed to be either acceptable or not. So it's a bit like the move from classical process algebra to stochastic process algebra with the constraint mark of chains to just say these are acceptable um, parameterizations of the model. Whereas we want to look at how likely certain things are. So we want to shift to using um, a distribution and so we get what we've termed a probabilistic constraint mark of chain. So we move to the so this is the idea that what they do is they just say, okay, any value between one and five is acceptable, whereas what we want is to put a distribution on that. In this case, we've chosen um, just a, a normal distribution there. So we have the set of states as previously an initial state, the uh, atomic proposition, um, propositions, and then our constraint function now is saying that for a state, 
and a rate, we give a, a value that uh, tells us how likely that setting of rates is for that transition. So we've got our target. This is what we want to map our proper, our process algebra model onto. We want to map this onto one of these um, probabilistic constraint Markov chains, which is actually a distribution over CTMCs. And what we find is actually the transition, um, the semantics, the transition relation for the capability stays exactly the same as by Pepper. Remember, we didn't change anything in that core part of the model. So that's the same. The only bit that we need to change is this stochastic relation. So rather than putting it into a concrete value for each case, we instead get a distribution of the rate for a particular transition. Um, and so this will then give rise to our underlying probabilistic constraint Markov chain. Okay, so we have a mathematical object. We have to choose quite how to use that. So we have a, a Markov chain or distribution over Markov chains. We start in the initial state. We reach a transition. And actually that transition has a distribution of rates. So we have two ways of thinking about how we interpret these dynamics. And the first is what we call a, an uncertain Markov chain, which means that we have this distribution of Markov chains, but each time we want to execute one, we pick one out of our bag of, of Markov chains, CTMCs, and we use that for every step of the simulation. Okay, so every time we reach a particular transition in a particular state, we will always use the same rate. It's the one we set at the beginning. So there is a Markov chain, we're just uncertain which one it is, and we're sampling from that distribution to try and find the right one. The other interpretation is what's called an imprecise Markov chain, and this says we leave the imprecision in the object that we're executing, and actually every time we come to a transition, we sample from the distribution that the semantics told us was there, and so we may be in exactly the same state with exactly the same transition, but actually get a different rate because we've sampled differently from the distribution. Uh, so we think that this model's a slightly different scenario. So it models a system, for example, where perhaps there's another compounding factor that's changing how our system executes. So for example, many biological processes are very sensitive to temperature. So if we're not explicitly modeling temperature in our system, we may include the distribution of rates, the different ranges that the rate may have, as uncertainty. And then as we execute the model, we just sample from that to represent temperature fluctuations that are happening. Um, we've done some work sort of investigating the relationship between these two interpretations. But for the moment, proper, as I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk, and as is encoded in the tool, works with the first one. So we pick one of the possible CTMCs, we keep that as a fixed CTMC for the whole of one execution, we get one trajectory out of that. Remember for simulation we always need to get many trajectories, when we want to do the next trajectory we pick another example. The structure of the CTMC is always the same but the parameterization changes. Okay, so we've got um, our model with some parameters that are, are distributions, and that gives us our distribution of CTMCs. And what we want to do now is to do some inference, building in observations, and reaching a new distribution over those possible models. Okay, and we're going to use the Bayesian framework, but in this case, exact inference is just impossible. We cannot calculate the likelihood exactly. So we use various approximation algorithms, or sometimes approximations on the system, um, and proper supports a number of these. And the tool, you can kind of, we've got, I think, three different algorithms that we've implemented in there, but it's also built in such a way that other people can plug in their own inference algorithms in a modular way. Different algorithms work better on different inputs, so I've already mentioned that we've got um, sometimes our observations of time series, and sometimes their logical properties. Um, we would use different inference algorithms for those. And there is a paper that actually gives you some guidance of which inference algorithm is better for which kind of model and input. So the one I'm going to talk about is the simplest one, which is very intuitive. 
which is called Approximate Bayesian Computation. And it's a simulation-based approach. So it approximates the posterior distribution simply by sampling. Okay, so the likelihood um, is very hard to compute for CTMC. So this just approximates the likelihood with the notion of distance. So say these are our, our data points. So this is something that we've got, for example, from a biological process. And we've observed it. And in the, the lab, we saw these um, time points of different values of the species, big X here. <coughs> And then what we do is we create a parameterization of our model. We pick one of those models out of our bag of um, CTMCs. We run it forward. We get a trajectory. Um, and then we look at how does this trajectory compare with those points. And we use some notion of distance here. Um, this one's pretty rubbish. Okay, So we would reject this. So this corresponds to one parameterization. So we have one theta that generated this. And we keep track and we say, well, that theta is no good. Okay. Now, it's not quite as definitive as that, because remember those simulations that we saw this morning? Uh, you can get different trajectories even with the same parameterization. So we don't discard that theta. We just put a little black mark against it. Because it may be that we've parameterized that model, ran it again, we get different random numbers, and it might produce a good trajectory. So we run many, many, and we look for the ones that are suitably close. We set some threshold, and we record for each parameter, uh, well, for each of the good trajectories, we look at which parameterization that corresponded to. And when we do this many times, it starts to develop a distribution over those parameter fittings. And so this is the basic idea of approximate Bayesian computation, which has been around for about 10 years. So we sample from our parameter set, according to the prior distribution. We simulate the system using those parameters. So we pick the CTMC, give it those parameter values, and then just run it um, through the simulation. If our distance is acceptable, we say this is a good parameterization. And if it's not, then we reject it. And um, you can prove from people, reasons people like approximate Bayesian computation is that as you uh, keep doing this and you make the distance tight, this will converge to the true um, posterior. Of course, there's a trade-off there of how small you make the distance, how many runs you're prepared to do, but it has some, some good grounding. Okay? And uh, we use slightly more, this is very naive, ABC, we use slightly more elaborate one, but essentially this is it. Okay, so let's look at some results. So this is our, our gossiping example again. Um, and what we did was we, we have some true values here, which I can't remember off the top of my head. I think they're 0 0.2 and 0 0.5. They're the ones that were in the original model at the beginning of the talk. Um, and we ran this model just once. So just one simulation run, and we took 10 sample points. And that was our time series for the data. And then we set this up where we've got this prior, which is a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. We use that as our trace information, just those 10, 10 sample points, and ABC as our inference. Okay, so um, say uniform priors, um, and it will reduce the posterior, which is a set of points that produce good samples, so that they were suitably close to our, um, our data. And in this case, our data is really very sparse. I mean, it's like saying, I just run my biology experiment once. And you know, I just uh, use that to, to try and fit a model. Okay, so this is my prior distribution. I don't really, I'm saying essentially I don't know anything. I have a range for each parameter, and they're all equally likely. And then when I run the, um, the ABC, this is what I get. So the red lines, so it must be 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. Uh, the red lines show the true values, which I use to generate my observations. And then the blue dots show me the, uh, the parameterizations that were producing acceptable outputs. OK, so if we split these, we see that here, what we're getting is quite a tight distribution around 0 0.1. Okay, so the rate of repression is quite tightly um, constrained, whereas here we've got quite a wide distribution. Okay, and we did look at this, we've had many more um, 
months to see whether we could improve this, and basically we can't. So we go back, what we see is there's actually quite a sharp cutoff from around here, just below 0 0.2. If the spreading rate is less than 0 0.2, then actually the system gets repressed. Remember, we started with a certain number of spreaders, but there's a rate at which they just repress each other. So if you don't get high enough spreading rates, actually the whole thing gets repressed before it takes off. Yeah. And then after that, it doesn't actually matter that much what that spreading rate is, you're going to get a spread, and that's why we have this very wide distribution here. So in some ways it seems we've not learned too much because we haven't exactly learned where this is, but we've learned something more. We've learned that it's not possible to get the spreading down at this end here, and that it's pretty insensitive to the value here. So we, we've learned about the posterior <coughs> Through the posterior, we've learned something about the dynamics of the system. So the second example I'm just going to show you briefly is um, a more biological example. So we're talking about two mutually repressing genes. Uh, so we have some promoters, which we don't actually show in our model, uh, which are genes that sort of uh, produce uh, or encourage the production of these um, proteins, and then the proteins will decay but as one protein is, um, the amount goes up, it represses the other one. So it's called a bistable behavior or a toggle switch. Um, and it happens quite a lot in biology. This one is artificially engineered. It was actually synthesized in a version of E. coli. So some synthetic biologists wanted to show the switching behavior and they modified this bacterium to, to, behave, to show that it behaves in this way. Um, and some previous people, some mathematicians, Tien and Burridge, showed that you really need some stochasticity in there, so you need a little bit of noise, otherwise the system um, will kind of just not switch. So this is a schematic view of our system. We have the gene here, which is on or off. This is gene 1, this is gene 2. When gene 1 is on, then this gene participates. So remember in the biopaper we had this whole notion of participating without changing your own count, so you don't go up or down, but you're necessary. So this participates in this reaction that makes a protein 1, um, and protein 1 will degrade after some time, but when there is some protein 1, what it does is it accelerates switching this gene 2 from on to off. So when gene 1 switches on, it starts producing protein 1 and switches off gene 2. And then this does the exact opposite, that when gene 2 is on, it produces protein 2, and that has the effect of switching off gene 1. So what we would expect is sort of oscillations of on and off um, interfaced. And in a moment we'll see some, some pictures of the simulation output. So in terms of describing it in biopepper, these are our genes. So the gene is involved um, in, it's increased by activation, it's decreased by deactivation, and it's involved in the expression just as a, a promoter, and similarly for the other gene, and then for the um, protein, it's increased by expression, it's decreased by um, degradation, and it's uh, involved in deactivation of the other, of the gene, the complementary gene. Okay, so this is just capturing what we have in the diagram. We assume that we start off with um, gene 1 activated, one copy of it. Gene 2 not currently present, so it needs to be activated. We've got 20 copies of protein 1 and none of protein 2. Here we've got a set of toggle observations, and again they've come from some experiments and we're using a different inference algorithm, something called roulette gibbs. Okay, so that was just the, um, the activation parts, this is the, the, what actually behaves, and then we have these kinetic laws as well for running the, the process forward, and these are our beta's. So these are the things that we just don't know what their rates are, so we don't know the rates of activation or deactivation or um, degradation or expression. So we've got eight unknowns there. But we know that the dynamics, so we know how these functions are formed, just not these parameters. 
So we again work from some simulated observations. We, we set certain true values, if you like, of the parameters. In this case, we give all the parameters gamma priors rather than uniform priors, um, and this is required for that uh, roulette Gibbs uh, type algorithm. And what we want to learn is those eight parameters. So we take 5,000 samples from the Gibbs like random truncation algorithm, which I'm not going to go into details of. We have um, here our promoters, so those are the genes. This is a pattern that we set but is unseen by the, the model. Um, this is what produced by that, that, parameter, that switching of the genes on and off. These are the protein counts, and you can see that they are, we've got um, blue is protein one, red is protein two, so when red goes down, blue comes up, and here. So it's not a perfect interleaving, because it's biology, nothing's ever perfect. Uh, we have some little false starts by red here, but it gets suppressed because of the amount of blue. But this is this is one run of the simulation with the true values, if you like, so the particular values that we've set. But what we actually give as observations is just these points. Okay, so these are all points just taken from um, that run. Okay, so we have a run for um, ten, and we take twenty points for each of the proteins. This is what we're training our model on. And then, I'm not going to show you all the parameters, this is just the first four. So in each of these, you can see the dashed line is our prior, okay, the red line is the true value, and the, the histogram are our um, inferred values. And you can see that it does pretty well from quite poor data. It wasn't the most informative data and we get quite good results there. Okay, so um, just to conclude, so the proper uh, pipeline is that we have a model which we can compile down to this low-level description, which for us is the um, probabilistic constraint Markov chain or distribution over Markov chains. We have an inference algorithm, and we have a number of different inference algorithms that then allow us to infer results, and then we can do all the things that we could do with the normal process algebra. So we might plot some um, results, we can do statistics, we can use it for prediction. Um, and it's a framework, as I mentioned earlier, which already supports a number of different inference engines, so it's already an engine much more than most uh, machine learning type techniques, and it's open for other people to add more inference techniques. Uh, one of the things that it can handle is infinite state space. So Pepper, completely conservative, we never get infinite state space. Uh, CTMC is typically very difficult to handle infinite state space. For biology, it happens a lot because you've got things that are being generated uh, and our inference algorithms can even cope with that. There's a paper that appeared just last year which summarizes the whole framework. Uh, this tool is not publicly available, but it's available if you would like it, so you just have to mail myself or Anastasis. It's not got a nice Eclipse user interface, uh, which is why we ask people to, to talk to us, because we can give you some help in getting started. It is being used by some biological groups, so for example, somebody at the MRC Center in Cambridge is using it, um, looking at, uh, what should Ben's looking at? Something to do with yeast. Yeah. Um, so, integrating CTMCs into process algebras has brought a lot of um, use for many different applications, and we feel that Prof is just taking that little step further by incorporating uncertainty into the same framework. Um, we think this has benefit both for the process algebra world, because we don't often know all the parameters, uh, but also for the machine learning world, because it demonstrates that you can have this more principled, language-based approach to building um, inference models and being able to reason with them. In this case, we've chosen syntax which essentially remains the same as BioPepper, which has um, a bunch of users already, and uh, the semantics are just slightly different because we shift this constraint to um, Markov chains to allow us to have a distribution rather than a single thing. Our observations, the ones that I've shown you, have all been time series, so we just look at certain points and say what values we have for the statement of those points. But there are also some examples, if you look um, in the paper, where we use logic expressions, so we use temporal logic that says something like the probability that 
the number of spreaders after 10 seconds is greater than, or 10 days is, is greater than 2, is 0 0.8. And so you can use this temporal logic formulae to be your observations and um, infer from those. And embedding the inference into a formal language uh, brings lots of possibilities, which we're still um, exploring. And some of the particular things that, that we're looking for, or uh, looking at at the moment, is uh, is there a way of uh, reasoning about the distance that we move? So, in some sense, how good are our observations? How far does um, this set of observations with this inference algorithm move us from this distribution to the posterior distribution. Um, and there's something called the Wasserstein distribu distribution, which is the distance between distributions, and we're looking at that. And then also, there are some applications where all the work so far has assumed that there is a kind of true parameterization of the model. We just don't know what it is, and we're seeking to narrow our posterior distribution down to be closer to telling us what that true distribution was. And that sort of matches with my examples because I didn't know what the true value was because I, I set it in my simulations that produced the samples. But there are many applications where actually it really is the case that there's a mix of things going on here. So it's not the case that all the cells behave the same. So for example, there's been a lot of work recently looking at heart muscle cells and to actually create the wave effect that we see in the muscle contraction in the cells you have to have a distribution of um, reaction to the stimulus that comes from the nerve. Okay, so people are looking at what they call ensemble models, where really uh, you do want a distribution of CTMCs. You don't want a single CTMC. You want some variability there, beyond the variability that's inherent in the CTMC itself, to actually create this um, overall effect. So the heart muscle is one. Another one that people are looking at is where they use bacteria to do water treatment, and you want a whole kind of ecology of slightly different um, bacteria within the system to try and get the optimal processing of things. So that's something else that we're also looking at. Okay, so this has been joint work in this case with um, <coughs> Federica Ciorgetta, who was one of my postdocs, and she and I developed the language Biopepper. And then proper uh, was joint work with Anastasis Googlers, who was one of my PhD students, and uh, my colleague Guido Sanguinetti. Thank you very much. At Edinburgh, we've got a number of CDTs, uh, particularly if you've been interested in what I'm talking about. We have a, a CDT in biomedical AI, which is very much looking at trying to use machine learning type techniques and logic type techniques to build models and understand biological processes related to disease and health in various different ways. And actually this is everything from mental records and looking at large cohorts of the population down to this kind of level of processes within cells and cancer in particular. So if anyone's interested in that, um, either speak to me or look at our website. Uh, we were awarded this only last month, so it's quite short notice and we're trying to recruit students for this September. It's a four-year PhD, fully funded for those that are eligible for UK funding. Okay, um, um, questions? So a lot to think about. But anything that you can so quickly come up and ask questions? No, you have to digest. What about down there, Marwan? Um, I think there, there's no questions, but when Jane uh, advertised for the PhDs, I saw a few uh, expressions just come alive. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see we have other CDTs too, but I don't want to advertise too much because I don't want my colleagues at St. Andrews to think I'm pinching all their best students, but we also have CDTs in robotics autonomous systems and um, in natural language processing, and those are all recruiting at the moment, and we also have lots of other PhD places too. Jane, I think you might just expect a couple of students come and talk to you. Okay, that's fine. <laughs>
That sounds good. Um, I actually have one question. <coughs> um, we read about a lot about machine learning being tried, or people try to apply machine learning to critical decisions, um, and the problem also often being that such decisions can't really be explained. So neural networks lack explainability. What you just yeah. described, to me, it seems that could be a very interesting approach to combine machine learning with more formal and more understandable methods to sort of apply to such decisions. Yes, so I think um, at the moment what we see is very much kind of two communities. So we see the deep learning based on neural networks and we see the more Bayesian approaches, which as you point out, has a bit more explainability because we can give some measure of our certainty in decisions and the rest of it. I think going forward, and we're starting to see this already, we're going to see a lot more of combination. The Bayesian techniques are limited in their scale, whereas neural networks uh, with deep learning have really exploded in the size of system that they can consider, uh, but they're not explainable. So deep, uh, neural networks are essentially building non-linear functions, but in ways that we can't actually see what the function is. So people are looking at ways of, of sort of injecting some Bayesian parts of that, so either putting uh, sort of alternating layers or, or different things to try and put some of this explainability into the neural networks. And that's particularly the approach um, for this biomedical AI, because I wouldn't say it's quite anti-deep learning, but it's very conscious that if you're going to make decisions about people's medical treatment, uh, you really want to be able to explain it. You don't want to just trust it to a deep neural network where you don't know how it works. Anyone else? It's getting very tired down there as well. No one, I guess, no one. He's asleep as well. <laughs> <laughs> questions if you want to find out more about the PhD opportunities in any way and so on. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you to all of you. It's a pleasure to be able to come.